It is uh, great to be uh, at the Southwest Church in Ada. Uh, there are a lot of people in this room who are very, very dear to my heart, and I thought I would tell you who they are, but the more I look around, the more people I see, so I better not start that, because I'll leave somebody's name out, and that would be uh, cruel, and uh, so I just know I love you. I'm thankful for you, for uh, your influence um, in my life and in the life of my family, and for what you do for the kingdom of God. It's been uh, good to be here this weekend. We talked about grief yesterday, uh, covered some tough topics. I uh, had a great uh, meal last night with your fine preacher, Brian. Uh, Brian and I have a lot of things in common and a lot of friends uh, that we know in common growing up in Alabama. Uh, Brian knows how to say Roll Tide, so I really like that about him. Uh, it's good to be with him, and it's good to be with all of you. I want to invite you this morning to open your Bible to Revelation chapter 4. Uh, we talked about um, some things we wish everybody knew about grief, and then this morning during the Bible class hour, we talked about the fact that we're not alone when we deal with grief or pain or heartache or tribulation or stress um, in our lives. Um, and now I want us to turn our attention to what John does as he talks to people who are enduring a lot of tribulation and a lot of pain. He calls their attention to the fact that someday heaven will be our home. And he talks about the beauty of heaven. That's what Revelation chapter 4 is all about. But before we get to the text of chapter 4, we need to go back to chapter 1 just for a moment. And if you were in the Bible class, you already heard this. But if you're not, we're not, it's important to get this. Revelation 1 verse 11, uh, John is writing. John is the author. He tells us in verse 1, verse 4, and verse 9. And in Revelation chapter 1 verse 11, Jesus is talking to John. And Jesus says to John, uh, write the things that you see and send it to the seven churches of Asia. Now, in, um, in the Greek language, you don't have to know Greek to understand the Bible, but there's sometimes that's a little bit helpful because in this particular verse, in verse 11, when John says, when Jesus says, write what you see, he uses the Greek word that's the word blepo. Now, that might not mean anything to you, but it's, uh, if you've ever taken Greek, first year Greek, uh, it's probably the first or second Greek verb that you learn to conjugate. Um, I remember we, had to, we went over that over and over and over again in first year Greek, and I've taught some classes a little bit in Greek, and we always talk about the verbs, and it means to see. It means to observe something. And Jesus says, write what you see, what you observe. And then you come down to verse 19, Jesus is still talking, and Jesus says, write the things that have been, the things that you see, um, the things that have been, the things that are, and the things that will take place after these things. Remember that last phrase. Now this time, Jesus uses a different word for the word see. He uses the word ido. Uh, it's, um, in our English, you'd spell it E-I-D-O. It's pronounced ido. A form of the word is what we call hara'o. And ido, it means to see and observe, but it has a deeper meaning to it. It means to know something. It means to understand something. It means to grasp it. It means to, uh, to see it and recognize the value of what you're seeing. And so this time, Jesus uses that word Ido. So uh, chapter 2 and 3, you have the letters to the seven churches. And then you come to chapter 4 and verse 1. John said, Behold, the word that John uses there is the word Ido. I saw, I observed, I understood. If you look at chapter 5, verse 1, he uses the word Ido. Chapter 6, verse 1, Ido. Chapter 7, verse 1, Ido. Chapter 8, verse 1, Ido. Chapter 9, verse 2, Ido. Chapter 10, chapter 11. By the way, in every chapter, for the rest of the book of Revelation, all 22 chapters, you'll find that word Ido in the chapters. Why is that important? Why is that significant? Why does that matter? Because Jesus said, write what you see what you understand, what you comprehend. And so John is writing for us, for those churches, and for all of us who are alive today in 2024, the things that he saw. And the first thing that John sees, if you look at chapter 4, verse 1, he says, I saw a door standing open in heaven. A door. Now, why is that important? Why does, why does John tell us that he sees this door open in heaven? Remember, these Christians were under great persecution. Some of them probably were in prison when they received this letter. They have maybe seen some of their loved ones put to death, thrown into the um, Colosseum, sewed up in animal skins, or burned at the stake because of their faith. And John 
says to them, there's a door in heaven. Now, if you're, if you're in prison and you're under the Roman ruler, you have no recourse. You can't walk into the emperor's palace. You don't have any kind of attorney or any kind of lawyer. And all of the doors for recourse are closed shut. You don't have anything that you can do to protect yourself or to help yourself. And John says, in heaven, there's a door that is wide open. When I was a student at uh, what was then Alabama Christian College, uh, back in 1900, none of your business, when I was in school there, there was a man who was running for governor of the state of Alabama. And he was running on what he called an open door policy. And he said, if I'm elected governor of Alabama, I'll take the door off the hinges to the governor's office. So some of the students went down to help him campaign, and uh, he won. He was elected. And he invited some of the students who helped him to come down and get our picture made behind the governor's desk, standing behind his desk. Well, you know what? When you walk in there, there's no door on his uh, office. He'd taken the door off the hinges. Now, they didn't tell you about the 12 other doors you had to get through first. Some of them had armed guards standing beside them. If you could get through there, you could get a door standing open in heaven. And a voice said, John, come on in. I'm reminded of Hebrews chapter 4, where the writer says, um, there is, um, we have a high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and um, uh, he sits at the right hand of God. And he says uh, that you can come before the throne of grace with boldness at any time you have a need in your life. The door in heaven is a reminder that we have access to the throne of God. No matter what you're going through in your life, no matter how much pain you're enduring, no matter how much grief you have in your life, sometimes you wonder, is there anybody I can talk to? Is there anybody who can help me? I want to tell you today, I'm happy to tell you today, that there's a door in heaven, and it's wide open, and the voice says, John, come on in. And John does. And John sees in heaven, if you look at chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, a throne that is set in heaven. Now, your Bible might say the throne is standing in heaven. It might say the throne is seated in heaven. It might say the throne is uh, sitting in heaven. It's all the same word. The, the Greek word is the word kami, and it means something that is buried. It's like it's been buried in the ground. It's not easily moved. Look, if you are under the rule of the Roman Empire, governments come and go. There, it, the world is very unstable in that empire. Well, guess what? We live in a world today where governments are unstable. Governments come and go. Some of us are very thankful for that. That's a different subject. But uh, governments come and go. There's a lot of change, a lot of turmoil. Listen to this. There's a throne sitting in heaven, and God is sitting on that throne, and Jesus Christ is sitting at his right hand, and that's the way it's been, and that's the way it always will be. And no matter what's going on down here on the earth, as unstable as our world can be, as unsure as we can be about our leaders, we can be certain that there is a throne in heaven, and God is sitting on that throne, and he allows us to come into his presence any time that we have a need in our life. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad that God is on his throne? Aren't you glad that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever? Aren't you glad that we have access to his throne, and we can walk in any time, day or night, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year, and that throne is available for us. God cares deeply about you. And whatever pain you're enduring today, and whatever grief you have in your heart, whatever you're dealing with in your life, in your family, in your work, in your financial situation, God cares deeply about you. And if you forget everything else we say this weekend, I hope you won't forget this. God invites you into his throne room to talk to him at any time about anything that is going on in your life. And the rest of chapter 4 is about God. It's about heaven. And what we learn in chapter 4 is that everything in heaven has its proximity to the throne. That everything in heaven is focused on the throne of God. Everything in heaven is geared toward, is looking to, is in the presence of the throne. As a matter of fact, in chapter 4, beginning in verse 2, uh, all the way down through verse 11, and there's 11 verses here, there are about, if I've counted correctly, 11 different prepositions. 
And every, prep, every one of these prepositions show that the object, uh, that is the, the, the object, the noun that is the object of the preposition is pointed toward the throne. It, is, it has its proximity to the throne. That means that everything in heaven is focused on God. Let's just look at some of them. Verse 2. I was in the spirit and behold a throne was standing in heaven and one was sitting on the throne. Verse 3. He who was sitting was like a jasper stone and a sardius in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throne like an emerald in appearance. Now watch this, verse 4. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and upon those thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their heads. Look at verse 5. Out from the throne came flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne. Verse 6. Before the throne there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal, in the center and around the throne, four living creatures. I go down to verse 9. When the living creatures give glory and honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever, verse 10, the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne. Well, what is that all about? It is just telling us that every person, every being, every object, Everything in heaven is focused on God. And when we are living our lives that are filled with turmoil and chaos and confusion and pain and heartache, the very best thing that we can do is focus our lives and our minds and our hearts on God. That's the best thing that we can do. There are some things that might help, but nothing will help more than focusing on God. And realizing that he is the one who created us, and he's the one who sustains us, and he was the one, he's the one who keeps us going, and he's the one who will never leave us or forsake us, and he is the one who blesses us. That's the very best thing that we can do. And that, not just in our own lives, but it has a lot to do with the church and with the worship of God. You know, sometimes in churches, we get into difficulties and, and problems and, and even some arguments sometimes down at church. And somebody complains because they don't like a certain kind of song being sung or, or they don't like the style of the preacher or they don't like something else about the church. And you know what we need to do? We need to get our eyes and our hearts and our minds off of what we like and what we want and focus them on God. And I promise you something. I don't know how many people there are here today, but if every person came to this building every Sunday... And if your focus, if every person's focus was on God and upon praising Him and upon worshiping the one who sits on the throne, you know what? You couldn't do it wrong. <laughs> you know why? Because I wouldn't be concerned about that. I'd be concerned about what God wants, not what I want, not what I like, not what I think is best, but what God wants. Look at verse 4. Around the throne were 24 thrones. And upon those thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their heads. So the picture I get is that when John walked into the door of heaven, he saw this massive throne that is the centerpiece of heaven, and it immediately arrested his attention. And then he looks around and he sees these 24 probably smaller thrones, and they're subordinate thrones, but they're focused on the big throne, the throne of God. And sitting on those thrones are who? 24 elders, the text says. You want to do an interesting study and enjoy a little humor, read some commentaries about who those 24 elders are. Um, some people say there 12 of them represent the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 sons of Jacob, or 12 prophets or 12 Old Testament worthies. And, of course, everybody knows the other 12 have to be apostles, right? There's only one problem with that. The Bible doesn't tell us who they are. All it says is they're elders. And I've wondered, in my mind, if they could be elders, men who have dedicated their life to the service of God, who, who give their time, who take away time from their family, who sacrifice to be shepherds in the church of God. Whoever they are, they're focused on the throne of God. Verse 7, the first living creature was like a lion, the second one like a calf, the third creature like the face of a man, the fourth like the flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within. And day and night, they do not cease. 
These are uh, probably angels. This is reminiscent of the angels in uh, uh, Isaiah chapter 6. Remember Isaiah walks into the Holy of Holies and he sees the seraphim, the covering angels, and he says they had six wings and with two they covered their face and with two they covered their feet and with two they flew. What are these angels doing? They're worshiping God. They're crying out, holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. You ever wonder why they say holy, holy, holy? See, holiness is, that's one of the attributes of God. And God has, God has two kinds of attributes. He has what we call the non-moral attributes, and he has moral attributes. Uh, you know, you're familiar with them, the non-moral attributes of God. God is om, omnipresent. God is omnipotent. God is omniscient. Those are non-moral attributes. You know what that means? That means that no human being can be any of these things. God is omnipotent. That means that God is all-powerful. He's all-powerful. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God is all-powerful? That there's Jesus said, with God, all things are possible. You know, when our children were young, we taught them to sing that song, My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. If you're hurting today, do you believe that? Do you believe that there's nothing that God can't do? He's omnipotent. God is, God is omnipresent. You know what that means? That means God can see everything. God is everywhere at the same time. No human being is omnipresent. When I was a kid, I thought my mother was omnipresent. <laughs> I remember the first time I got in trouble in school, the first time in many. Of many, I walked home and my mother said, how was school today? I said, it was great. She said, how did it go at the principal's office? And I said, how did you know about the principal's office? And my mother said, I have eyes in the back of my head. I thought my mother was omnipresent. No human being is omnipresent, but God is. God is omniscient. You know what that means? That means God knows everything. You, you can listen. Listen to that word omniscient, the word science. It means knowledge. God has all knowledge. No human being is omniscient. I don't know about you, but I've met some people in my life who acted like they thought they knew everything. <laughs> no human being is omniscient. God is immutable. That means he never changes. We change all the time, but God never changes. Those are non-moral. You can work on your omnipotence and omniscience and omnipresence all day long. It's not going to get any better. But then God has moral characteristics. If somebody said to you, define God with one word, what word would you use? You would probably use the word love. That's what the word John used. God is love. We love him because he first loved us. If we love, if we don't love our brother who we see, our fellow man, how can we love God who we've not seen? God is love. That's a, that's a moral characteristic. That means we can grow in our love. God is patient. He's long-suffering. Peter said, the Lord is long-suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's a moral characteristic. I, I, I need to work on my patience. I struggle with it, especially when I'm driving down I-35 in Dallas, in the middle of the day. I struggle with patience. Heard about a guy one time. He called his wife. He said, I, on the way home from work, she had just gotten home from work, and she said, honey, be careful, I hear there's an idiot out there on I-35 driving the wrong direction. He said, oh no, honey, there's thousands of them. <laughs> Sometimes we need to work on our patience, don't we? God is long-suffering. God is, God is compassionate. He cares about you. He cares deeply for you. God is kind. And he wants us to be kind to one another. He wants husbands to be kind to wives and wives to be kind to husbands. God is kind. And God is holy. He wants us to be holy. That's a moral characteristic. We can't be holy exactly like God is holy, but we can grow in our holiness. Holy, holy, holy. One writer said it means holy, holier, holiest. That God is the holiest of all 
beings in the, the entire universe. And he wants us to be holy. And we worship a holy God and we serve a holy God. And we want to be more like a holy God. And then verse 10. The 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever. And they will cast their crowns before him. Go back to chapter 4, verse 4. These 24 elders are sitting on thrones and they've been given golden crowns that are placed on their head. Paul said, I've fought a good fight. I've finished the course. I've kept the faith. Therefore, I know there's a crown of righteousness laid up for me in heaven, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me in that day and not to me only, but to all those who love his appearing. These elders are sitting on thrones and they've got golden crowns on their head. And then verse 11 says they approach the throne of God. And as they do, they take those crowns off their heads and they cast them before the Lord. And we say, of course they do that. Why do they do that? Because they know what all of us should know, that there's no way they got those crowns based upon their goodness or their actions or who they are or how great they are. Remember Paul's words? Paul said, Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And Paul said, Thanks be unto God. Watch this. Thanks be unto God who gives us the victory through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. They knew that the only way, the only way they got to heaven was because of Jesus Christ. And when they walk in the presence of God, they can't help themselves but take those thrones off their head, those crowns off their head, and throw them before God in worship to Him. And I believe that someday we'll do the same thing. If we make it to heaven, we'll know that it's not because I'm good or because I'm special or because I've done anything great, but it'll be because God is good. It'll be because Jesus Christ paid for my salvation, and he paved the way for all of us to have victory in our lives, to be able to live among the angels in heaven around the throne of God and worship him forever and ever and ever. You ready for that? You ready? There's a great day coming, a great day coming. There's a great day coming by and by. Are you ready? I've always thought I wanted to go to heaven. When my grandfather died, I was nine years old. I thought, I want to go to heaven because I know he's in heaven. When my mother died in 2005, I thought, I want to go to heaven because I know she's in heaven. When we lost a little boy, didn't live but just a few minutes, there's no doubt in my mind that he's in heaven. I want to go to heaven. When I lost my dad, my mentor, the man who shaped my life. I thought, I want to go to heaven. But never in my life I wanted to go to heaven more than when I lost my sweet wife. She was the best person I know. And she's in heaven. And I want to go to heaven. And sometimes I think about it. And I think someday, either I'm going to pass away, and I'm going to go into eternity, or Jesus Christ is going to come first. He's going to come in the clouds. You ready? There are days that I think in my life, oh, I wish he would come today. I wish he would come today. Are you ready? Heaven is going to be the most glorious, beautiful, wonderful place that we can imagine in our lives. The writers of Scripture tried to describe it in ways that, that we could understand. Streets paved with gold, 
walls made of jasper, clouds, angels singing, hosts of heaven gathered around the throne. <laughs> they can't do it justice. Paul said, I has not seen nor ear has heard the things, listen to this church, the things that God has prepared for you. He's prepared them for you. You ready? I hope you want to go to heaven. And I hope to see you there. If you're not a Christian today, we want to encourage you to know that we don't, we don't, we're not trying to be ugly about this, but if you don't commit your life to Jesus, if you don't obey him, you can't go to heaven. That's just the rules of the game. None of us deserve to go there, no matter what we do, but you can't get there if you don't at least do what, at the least what God has asked you to do. So today, maybe you're here and you've never obeyed Jesus Christ. You think, I want to go to heaven, but you got to obey Christ. And if you believe that he's the Son of God and you'll give him your life in repentance and if you'll confess his name and be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins, he will wash away all of your sins. He'll add you to his church. He'll write your name in the Lamb's book of life and he'll put you on your road to glory. And if you're a Christian today, maybe you became a child of God a long time ago and maybe, maybe something's happened in your life and you got mad at God or mad at the church and, and, and maybe life hasn't gone the way you wanted it to. It's caused you to turn on God. You got to be close to God if you want to go live with him forever. So don't, don't take a chance of losing the most beautiful, eternal place that our minds can imagine just because you got upset with somebody. If you need to ask for prayers of the church family, I know these people would love to pray for you and they would love to help you. If there's anything we can do for you, I hope you'll make up your mind today, more than ever before, that you want to go to heaven. If we can help you while we stand and sing, we hope you'll come.